All right, can everyone hear me? Um, just to be sure that I'm not too loud or too quiet, just shout in chat. All right, Tokofrol says, yes, we can hear you. Very good, very good, very good, very good. Um, yeah, so let's start then. Um, I hope everyone had a good week. I hope everyone was uh, was able to do the, uh, do the assignments. Um, We've had some votes on the poll that I put up on Moodle, so that's all good. Um, so, yeah. Um, stream will start soon. No, we already started. So, today more introduction. Um, we had the first introductory lecture last week. This week we will have another introductory lecture. Um, it's, it's just going to be very, very basic R. Um, so, you will have two lectures followed and we will not ha even have discussed how to load in data. Mata Cloud, thank you for following. Um, is the following sound okay or is that too loud as well? Um, I didn't change it from last time and if we don't get too many followers then it should be fine. Um, didn't hear it? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, no, that's true. I actually muted the follower sound. So um, the next follower should be uh, should be audible. All right, so yeah, um, more introduction. Um, but of course, first we have two things to do. Um, so um, in which order do we want to do this? Do we want to first do the answers to the lecture or do we first want to look at the Zoom meeting votes? Um, I'm, I'm up for anything, so answers. Okay, good, good, good. All right, so my answers for lecture one. Um, so I'm not gonna do the question zero thing because I hope everyone was uh, able to install R um, and um, install a good text editor. Um, so that should be fine. Um, so these are my answers. So the first question was just to use R as a calculator. Um, so hey, you just have to type in stuff um, like uh, 123 plus 4567 um, and then some other things. Um, the logarithm is just log, which is the natural logarithm. So if you want to have the logarithm base 10, you would have to type log 10. Um, you can divide, you can multiply, you can do Euclidean division. Um, actually, we ran into an example of Euclidean division yesterday. Um, since people generally ask why is Euclidean division meaningful, but um, we were talking about Mother's Day and how it moves every year. Um, and that's of course and the same as your birthday. Like if, you're, if your birthday is on a Monday, then next year your birthday won't be on a Monday. And that of course is because there's a difference in 52 times 7. Um, and then had, since there's only 365 days in a year, um, you, you end up with kind of an overflow and a Euclidean division would be able to tell you if you um, would be having your birthday on a Monday or on a Tuesday or on a Sunday next year. Um, so Euclidean division is just done by the uh, percent percent um, or the Euclidean division remainder. Of course, in this case, it, it should be four. Um, square root, um, if you want to take the square root of a negative number, remember that you have to add the plus zero i. Um, you have to tell R that they are imaginary numbers. Um, so let's quickly uh, go to R um, and show you guys that when I copy paste in um, the answers that it will just work. Um, so hey, you can see that it just adds up numbers. So hey, it, using R, it's just a very fancy calculator. Um, and that, that's because it's a, a, a REPL system. So you just type into and it just executes your commands one by one. Um, so nothing to do yet for Okay, so there's the sound, Evo Luzi, thank you for following. Um, sound not too loud? I think I can just talk over the sound, but um, I hear it relatively loud in my headphones. Um, I was listening to some music before we started, so... Um, <coughs> still didn't hear it. What the hell's going on here? Uh, well, then the sound might be broken, I, I, then I have to check the code. Um, but I'm not going to do that now. Barity can hear it as well. All right, then I'll put it up a little, little, little bit more. So I'm just hoping that I don't get... I don't need to hear it, though. Yeah, no, that that's true. That's true. 
it already shows on the screen, right, that people follow. So that should be good enough. Uh, all right, so let's go back to my uh, question. So in the next part, um, so hey, I hope that everyone understands that we can just use R as a calculator. Um, and then, of course, we want to define some vectors because um, hey, it only starts becoming fun when you have more than a couple of numbers and when you do things like vectors. Um, so the first question is, is use the uh, combine, so the C function, to create a vector from 1 to 10. Um, of course, if you want to do it with the uh, with the combine operator, then of course you have to specify all of the numbers independently. Um, you don't really have to. Um, you could answer this question like this as well, which is a little bit sneaky, um, but this would work as well. So, and then you don't have to type 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Um, but head first question, just use the C function. So C is a function, so remember functions you call using round brackets. Not square brackets, round brackets. Um, vector 2b, um, so head using the double point operator. So the double point operator is very similar to the sec function, um, which defines a sequence, um, but it has the by parameter, so the, the step size is always 1 or minus 1 when you use the double point operator. So the double point operator can go up and it can go down, but it will always go up and down by just a single number. Um, question 2c, we can use the sec function to create more complex vectors, create a vector from 1 to 100 going in steps of 5, um, so you do that like this, so you just call the sec function, the sec function has three parameters, it has the parameter from, to, and then by. Alright, and then we come to the really well, the, the first question, which is a little bit harder and where people have to think about it, and this already becomes a little bit tricky, right? So the question was, um, use the letters constant and the sec function to create a vector that stores all the even numbers, uh, all the even letters, right? So the even letters, like numbers can be odd or even, so odd means that you're not divisible by 2, uh, even means that you're divisible by 2. Um, so of course there's uh, 26 letters in the alphabet, um, so the even letters, um, but we can specify the, the even numbers by going from 2 to 26, stepping by 2, and we can then use this vector that we create to select from the letters vector. So letters is just a vector, so if we select something from a vector, we use square brackets, so we just say letters, square brackets open, and then we put in the sequence that we want to select, so we want to select letter number 2, 4, 6, and so forth, yeah, so that's what we do using the sec function, and now vector 2d will contain all the kind of even letters, although letters can't really be even. Alright, and then to question 2e was, what is the type of vector 2a? Either use the class function or ask explicitly using the ES numeric. Um, so here just to kind of show you guys that uh, a vector is always of a, of a single type. Right, so vector 2a is of course a numeric vector because we only put numbers in there. Um, and then we can ask what is the class and then it will say numeric. Um, if we want to use the class later on in things like an if statement, all right, question from General Gulag. Could you leave the by is away? Basically like, yes, yes. It has three parameters and it will automatically go. Um, the nice thing by specifying the name of the parameter, uh, you can actually move it around. So this would be uh, the same thing. So by five, one to a hundred. Um, and if you name your parameters, you, you don't have to adhere to the order. So the order is from, to, by, but if you specify them yourself, so if you explicitly name the parameter, you can put it anywhere you want. Um, question from Rigoletti, can you quickly operate 2D in R? Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Um, so let's go to R, so let's show you guys the R window, so 2D. That's the one with the uh, letters, right? Um, so if you would look at just letters, right, then it would just contain all of the letters. Um, and if you would say sequence um, from 2 to 26 by 2, um, then it will just give you the, the ones that we want to select, so 2, 4, 6, 8, and so forth. Um, and now we can combine it, so we can just from letters select this, um, and then you get the, the even letters. Um, or was this 2C? No, this was 2D. Is that 
the clear it's 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 just selecting from a vector um, and many people don't realize but like these built-in constants like letters um, with capitals and small letters um, and even the months like um, here so you have a month dot up oh forgetting it so these are the abbre abbre abbreviations for the months so if I want to have the um, the even months of the year um, then I can do the same thing I can say check from 2 to 12 since they're 12 months by 2 and now these are the even months so February April June August October and December are even so hope that that's clear all right let's go back to my answers then um, so yeah so you can use the class to to get a, a character which holds the class um, but you can also ask explicitly and this is very handy um, because the is numeric will give you a logical value um, which we later can use in things like um, for loops or while loops or if statements um, so that's the way that you want to do it um, and then 2f is uh, qu was a question hey, when you combine vectors 2a and 2d um, what is the type of the resulting vector? So vector 2a is a character vector, is a numerical vector. Um, vector 2d is, of course, a character vector because it contains letters. Um, and if we combine them together into a single vector, and I will show you how this looks in R. Um, so when we go to R, uh, like this, then we can combine them. Um, oh, I didn't save them. Let me first run the whole code. So defining all the four vectors all right so now when we try to combine these two vectors into one um, then what you will see is that now everything gets these double quotes surrounding it so that means um, because a character cannot be transformed into a numeric R does it the other way so it takes the numeric values and it then transforms them into kind of character values um, and then of course when you combine them and then you ask for the class of it and then of course the class of the whole vector gets upgraded to being a character vector and that's the level or the layeredness of the type system it will always try to put it in the lowest type um, and in this case the lowest type is character because numbers can be caught in a character vector um, but the other way around is not possible all right, then the next uh, assignment was a little bit matrices. So the matrices, uh, we can look. So the first question is, is uh, we can use the matrix function to create a matrix, create a 10 by 10 matrix that holds the number of one to 100. Um, so of course we can just use the matrix function and I'm just gonna store this in variable 3a. So let's quickly move to R and define this matrix. And now when I type matrix 3A, of course, um, it will show me the matrix, right? So the first thing that we notice is that R fills matrices on a column wise basis. So it first fills column one, then it fills column two. Um, and then hey, if you look at the help file of the matrix function, so question 3B, um, you see that there's a parameter called by row. So if you use the by row parameter, um, it it fills it the other way around. So it first fills row number one, then row number two. Um, so let's do that. So let's define matrix 3B. And now we're just going to say by row um, is true. Oh, um, all small letters probably. And now when we look at matrix 3B, we now see that it filled it the other way around. So we just go by row, like the parameter says. Alright, so question 3C, select the fifth column of matrix 3A and select the fifth row of matrix 3B. So of course these will be equal, so from matrix 3A I can select the fifth row by just saying uh, fifth column, so comma 5, right? So I say give me all the rows and then only column number 5. So and that's why I don't put anything here. Um, I could put like a 1 to the number of rows of matrix 3a but this is the kind of the default value right but so you don't have to specify that you can just leave it empty and usually um, for clarity I would put a, a space here so just to make sure that it's obvious that you're selecting the column and yeah, because in in the in the in this in the indexing um, hey you first have the rows and then you have the columns so I generally 
tend to put a space there to, to kind of visually have the uh, cue that I'm selecting all of the rows. Um, so hey, this is the fifth column from 3A and the fifth row from 3B uh, and of course that will be the same. So both of them are vectors, they are of length 10 um, and they contain numeric values. Alright, so then question 3B or 3D was how can we translate matrix 3A into 3B? Um, and here there was a little typo because it's it, the, there should be a hint um, because the, the word here is how can we translate and I didn't mean translate but I meant transpose because we, we looked at the transpose function um, so hey if we would take matrix 3b and we would transpose matrix 3b then hey, instead of being now on a row wise basis it will now go to a column wise matrix so that means that when I transpose matrix 3b it becomes identical to matrix 3a and of course we can we can check that that is true so I can just say is equal to which is the double a is because a single is character is is uh, assigning two so we don't want to assign two but we just want to check and then we can say matrix 3a um, and now it will say true 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 for all of the values in in, in these matrices um, is there a difference to using this command as opposed to the command from 3b the, the transpose function you mean so using the T um, on a matrix. Uh, when, when you're defining your matrices yourself, you generally don't transpose them. So you make them in the correct format. Um, but if you, it's often that when, when you're doing bioinformatics, right? Or when you're doing just programming, then generally you get data, which is in a certain format. And um, for example, you download data from a website online somewhere and they might have the data in the opposite format as that you want. Um, have for example if I look at matrix uh, 3a right uh, matrix 3a right and I want to calculate the correlation right so that would be a bad example because the correlation would be one I think for each of them. Um, so I can use the core function to calculate the correlation matrix and the correlation function correlates column one with column two, column one with column three, column one with column four, and so on. So it works on a column wise basis. So if I want to get, so um, let's just give some names to this thing. Um, so add column names using the letters constant. So I can say call names of matrix 3A is uh, letters um, and I have 10 columns. So I take the first 10 letters. Right, so now when I look at matrix 3A, it now has letters on the top. And I could, for example, give it also row names. Um, so I could say the row names of this matrix are not the letters, but let's do 3F. So you can use the paste function to say, well, I want to have uh, the word individual and then combined with 1 to 10. Um, and hey, if I would do this like this, without assigning it, then it would just say individual one, two, three, four, and so on. Um, and of course I can do this and as a little trick, right? If you already have written what you want and then want to assign it to something, you can also use the forward pointing arrow. So it just, the, the arrow just points to where you want to assign. So I can say something like this as well. Um, so assign this, what I just created into the column names of matrix uh, 3a and now when I look at matrix 3a then you can see right that now I have column names and individuals here are in the rows so imagine that I'm using the correlation function but I actually want to have the correlation between individuals um, then of course I, I can I can use the transpose uh, the transpose function right so I could say correlation of matrix 3a which would normally give me the correlation of each column with each other column. And of course, this is a bad example because they're all one. Um, but if I want to have the correlation between the individuals, then I can easily do the same thing. But now I just have to transpose the function, uh, to transpose the matrix before throwing it into the function. And then of course, now I have the correlation of each individual to each other individual. So the transpose function is really useful when you're 
when your kind of layout of the matrix or of the data that you have loaded is in the opposite format um, compared to what your function wants. And many functions work on a, on a column-based system and some functions work on a row-based system. So it really depends on the function that you're trying to use if you have to transpose your matrix or not. Um, and I think those were already it. So those were the assignments. So um, we already used the paste function. Um, in this case, in the assignments, it should be measurement. Um, but here we just used it for individual. Um, so as a little tip, um, the, the, the arrow can be turned around and you can assign stuff instead of having th your variable arrow pointing in the variable and then what you want to assign to it. Um, what is paste zero good for? So paste zero is the same as uh, paste, um, but um, if you do paste right, um, then you can see that it automatically has a space between the first thing and the second thing that you're trying to paste. Um, paste zero um, doesn't do the space, so it, it just pastes things together. So um, and of course you can you. So paste zero is just defined as paste, um, where the separator is nothing. That's the only difference. So paste zero is equal to paste, um, but it just set it, the default separator is different. So the default separator for paste is a space, and for paste zero it's nothing. So it's an, an empty string like this. Any more questions? So I hope everyone was able to do the assignments um, and that, that everyone was able to figure it out. I think the hardest one is the, the even numbers and the even letters. Um, because there, of course, you have to take two steps. Have one step is to realize that you can use the sec function quite easily to get all the even numbers. And then, of course, the second step is to realize that letters is just a vector. So you can just select from the vector using the square brackets and then putting the things in. All right, so I will put my uh, my answers online. So um, this this file, I will just put it online on Moodle for everyone to see, um, and um, that's kind of um, it for the assignments. So I hope that everyone was able to do them. Um, make sure, or at least like program cleanly, right? So give it a header, um, write down the names of the questions, um, and make it look good. Things which look good tend to be more correct than things which just look sloppy. Although there's no direct correlation, it's just something that I found. So. All right, so then for the, um, oh, the little, um, let me see, let me go back to the PowerPoint, the Zoom meeting. So um, last week I asked you guys if you wanted to do a one hour Zoom meeting um, so that we, so that I can help you with the assignments or that you guys can help each other with the assignments and I think it would be a good idea so we put it on Moodle right and everyone voted or not everyone voted but at least we had some votes um, and instead of just telling you what the what the result is I thought it would be nice to just load it into R oh okay so now we should have this sound crazy umbrella thank you for following um, Sound not too loud? Can pe did people hear it now, or is it still broken? If it's still broken, then I will just disable the, uh, the, the, the sound altogether. Because I hear it quite loud in my headphones. All right, yeah, worked it. Good, OK. Um, so um, what a <laughs> beautiful, yeah, yeah. I spend a lot of time. Um, I actually have another sound. Like, if I say hi, bot, because the, I just have a little robot listening to the channel, um, and that's under my name. So when I say hi, bot, um, then you get like the little witch cackle in, in the background. That's just for me to check that the overlay is working and that it, follow, uh, that it can follow the followers and, and follow the chat. Um, all right, so the votes for the Zoom meeting, I don't know exactly how many votes we had. We can look at that. Um, but of course, I thought it would be nice to just analyze it using R because that's what we're here for, right? So why not use R to look at the, the votes? Um, so 
<laughs> so um, here's a small script to tabulate the votes for the weekly Zoom meeting. Um, again, copyrighted by me, first written then, and I didn't put any comments in there. So let me go, uh, let me show you guys actually um, if I. If I take the results from Moodle, I just get a little comma separated file. And fortunately, this is more or less, um, how do you call it, anonymized, right? Um, so this is how it looks like um, when I downloaded the file from Moodle. So you guys voted. Um, I don't know how many people exactly voted, but you see here that there's dates and the times. And this is just the format that you get from, uh, from Moodle. Um, so I made a little script to do that. So the first thing that I do is set my working directory. And in this case, it's of course in my downloads folder because I just click download and then save. Um, so let's go to R, move to the downloads folder. And of course I have a bunch of stuff there, um, but uh, also the votes are in there. So I can just go there, right? So now when I do like a, a deer, um, then I see all of the files that I downloaded since I started using this computer, which is just like a lot, um, which you don't, well, you probably don't, aren't interested in what I have on my downloads folder. Um, but the, the, the file that I downloaded was called, and let me see that. So if we go back to Notepad++, um, then the file that I downloaded was vote for the weekly Zoom meeting date and time.csv. So in R, you have a function which is called read CSV. We will get into that function in detail when we do lecture number three um, to, to lo load data. Um, but um, the read CSV function uh, takes as a parameter the file name that you want to read. So and then it reads in this thing as a little matrix. Um, so this thing has uh, two columns. Um, and the first thing that I do is read CSV. So I read this file that I just showed you guys and I read it into a variable called votes. Um, so let's do that and show you guys what happens. So let's go to votes. And then when I type votes, um, it looks like this. So it's a little bit unstructured, um, but the way that you can, can see it is that, well, you have the first is the response number. So in total, 17 people filled in the, the questionnaire. Um, and then in the second column, you see the answer. And since that, since people could choose multiple times, um, these answers are separated by slash n. And the slash n means new line. So that's the enter key on your computer um, or on your keyboard. So the slash new line is separating each of the answers. So some people only chose like um, two dates. Some people chose one. Um, and this was me choosing all of them um, because, well, it was my poll. I was the first one to fill it in and I don't care because like I was available on all the different times. So that was good. Um, so the first thing that we want to do when we want to analyze this and make a little graph out of it is to um, um, take the second column, right? So um, I, I did this very explicitly step by step. So I just take the second column, which contains the answers and then put it in something called vote vector. Right, because votes itself is a matrix which has two columns and 17 rows. And now I'm, I just take the second column, which means that I get a vector. Um, and hey, of course, selecting a, a, a row or a column from a matrix will always give you a vector. So, so let's do that. Let's go back to R for you guys. And now when we look at the vote vector, um, it already looks a little bit better. So now it's just a single vector, which has 17 elements. Um, and you can see that from, from the numbering in the front. And now each of these answers still has like the multiple new lines in there. Um, and or and if people answered multiple times. So the first thing that we wanted or that I wanted to do was use the string split function, right? Because I want to split all of these answers from each other because I just want to know um, how often people chose Wednesday 15 uh, or uh, Wednesday at three or how often they choose Wednesday, Tuesday at three. Um, so um, there's a function called str split, which tr splits strings into their individual components. So if we look at the vote vector, we can split it um, by this new line character, right, which separates the different answers. And then what we get is something which looks like this. So it sneakily turned it into a list. And that's, you can see that it's a list by the double brackets, like I told you last week, because a list is something special. Um, and because now at the first element of the list, um, there is a vector and this vector has a length of six. So the first person who answered it gave six 
or selected six different options the second person that answered it gave two different options or selected two different options so but I don't want to have it in a list I want to have just everything in in kind of one vector um, so then I can use the unlist function so the unlist function um, will take a list and then just put every element of the list behind each other so if I do an unlist on this 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 uh, this if I do an unlist on the list that I just created by string splitting uh, then now it looks like this and now you can see that we have all of the different votes um, and it, now it's not clear that the first six came from the first user and then the, the next two came from the second user um, but that this is something that we can save let me look at my cheat sheet and I saved it in something called separate votes separated votes so the separated votes now just contains all of the individual answers that people gave um, and where we're we've kind of removed the fact that one person could give multiple answers so now the only thing they left to do is to table this um, so we can just make make a table of this and then R will take all of the elements and count how often each element occurs so we see that there were two votes for Monday at 11 there were four votes for Monday at, at 3 um, and we see that we have a tie for Tuesday um, and Wednesday so Tuesday at 3 and Wednesday at 3 had a tie um, we can actually make it a little bit better because we can actually just say um, box plot no not box plot um, bar plot yeah we can bar plot it um, and we can create a nice bar plot showing the votes that people gave um, so here you see the individual time points let me move it up so that the, the no, it's a little bit too small and a little bit more come on come on axis no you can see that it doesn't it doesn't have enough space to print this axis um, so can I do that no um, I probably have to specify it well, it doesn't really change the, the, the size of the axis, but this was the, the, the voting layout if we wanted to show it in a bar graph. Um, but Tuesday and Wednesday ended up being equal, but someone mailed me that they wanted to change their vote, which you couldn't because it's a vote once. Um, so let me see what the change was. Um, yeah, so Skorita mailed me saying that um, why is the bar part limited to 10 but the number of answers it is? Oh, I didn't um, see that. Oh yeah, it doesn't have the full axis. Well, it, it's higher than, than 10, right? It, it It's just a bar plot. I, I don't like the bar plot that much, but um, it's it's just it doesn't have a real axis at the bottom either. And I and like I try to actually like make the axis a little bit smaller, um, and so you could do the same thing like this. Cx is 0 0.7 to force all of the numbers or force all of the letters being plotted to be smaller, um, and we'll get to that. Um, and now you can see that at least this axis now has all of the different um, things. So CEX stands for the magnification of the point size. Uh, but the y-axis, um, I have no idea why it doesn't put the whole axis here. No idea. I, I know that I could probably do something like this um, to, to flip everything around. Now at least the y-axis is in the correct ordering, but not, or, or at least the correct way of reading the numbers, but now the, the bottom is not. But, um, but I, I don't know why it doesn't plot 11 or at least 12. Um, n no idea. I, I almost never use the bar plot function. If I want to have bar plots, I make them myself. So I just use the standard plot function um, and, and just draw the bars myself. Um, but um, Skorita wanted to change her vote and she says that she voted for Wednesday, um, but she would like to change it to Tuesday afternoon. Um, so that means that we will have the Zoom meeting at Tuesday afternoon because if we subtract one vote from Wednesday and put it on to Tuesday afternoon um, then Tuesday wins by a margin of two. So yeah, Tuesday afternoon will be the Zoom meeting. So it's decided. So if anyone really, 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 really doesn't want to have it on Tuesday afternoon then I'm sorry but I'm not gonna spend three 
days a week to, uh, to yeah, well, it's already an extra investment for me to, to do an extra hour, but I'm perfectly fine with that, so. Um, but yeah, so Tuesday five or Tuesday at three, we will have the Zoom meeting. Um, I will put the Zoom link on Moodle so that everyone can just click the Zoom Moodle link and then just go there. Um, and again, if you have any issues with that, just um, send me an email. All right, so the Zoom meeting Tuesdays. Okay, so. Uh, the meeting will be to discuss the assignments. Yes, yes, Giorgio, that's true. We will just discuss the assignments and um, if people get stuck, then I can give a little bit of tips or help. Um, and the nice thing is, is that, uh, uh, I mean, there are not any additional info which we miss if we cannot participate. No, 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 no. It's just to have you guys, so that, hey, if you get stuck, um, hey, because like the, the assignments come online on today so um, hey you can then work during the weekend on the assignments um, but it's always annoying if you get stuck um, that you have to wait the whole week before you see the answers to the lecture so the idea is is that when on Wednesday you you're still stuck or um, sorry Tuesday uh, when you're stuck then on Tuesday we can have like a one-hour meeting and help people so that on Wednesday they still have time to finish the rest of the assignments um, but I'm I'm not gonna give a lecture or put stuff for the exam into the. Uh, will they be recorded? I, I could. There's a little bit of a dot and shoot issue there, of course, because it's Germany and like I could record myself using OBS. So I I think that that should be fine. Um, so yeah, let's just record them. I actually forgot to start the recording today. I am so stupid. So remind me next hour, um, then I have to just get the first hour from Twitch. So I hope that Twitch doesn't mess up and, and does save the, the stream. That's so stupid. Like I've, uh, let's just start it again. Anyway, doesn't matter. Uh, so the last lecture, um, we used R as a calculator. Uh, we looked at the different types of data. So I hope that everyone still remembers logical, numeric, character, vector, and list, and matrix and data frame. Um, if we want to index data, uh, we use a square bracket, a single square bracket for all of these types, and we use the double square bracket only for the list type. And that's because the list is special, because the list can hold anything that it wants, even a matrix or another list. Um, so that's why you need the double double square brackets. Um, we also talked about using the dollar sign for indexing um, if you want to index by name. Um, I also told you about the sequence, the repeat and the 1 to uh, 20 function. Is it possible for you to record the Zoom meeting and upload it to Moodle as the assignments clarification? Because I didn't know that before about the date and I looked my workshop next Tuesday. Okay, yeah, no, I will, I will record them. So I will, I will do my best to not forget to record them. So it should be fine. And of course, if you have any questions in the assignments and you're working on it during the weekend um, and you get stuck and you really want to continue, uh, th then just send me an email, right? That, that's probably the quickest way to get, get out of a I'm stuck moment. Um, because it, it's really annoying if you get stuck and then you don't want to wait three days um, to join the meeting. Um, so if you, if you, if you are working on one of the assignments, you get stuck and you really want to continue, then just shoot me an email. I generally answer between like 30 minutes to an hour. Um, it depends a little bit on Netflix. Like if, it, if I've just started a Netflix like show, then it, it might be that it's an hour and a half. Um, but generally I'm pretty good at, at monitoring my emails. So just shoot me an email if you get stuck. All right, then let's start today's lecture. So today's lecture, we are going to uh, talk about, uh, well, the answers to the previous assignments. We already did that, um, but I want to talk a little bit more about variables and then we will start introducing some control structures so that we can do stuff with the variables. Um, and I want to talk to you about the difference between a statement and an expression. Um, we will very, very coarsely look at what functions are and how we can use them and how we can create them ourselves. Um, I will talk to you guys about brackets. I already do that a lot. Like hey, when you call a function, use round brackets. When you 
select something from a vector, um, use square brackets, um, but when we are starting to do functions and control structures, we will also introduce curly brackets. So the curly brackets are the third and last type of bracket that you need um, for doing stuff with R. Um, then I also want to talk to you about escaping the inevitable, um, because some things we want to, or we might want to print to the screen or to a file, um, but we need to make sure that we can escape some characters. Um, I want to talk to you guys about some randomness, so um, how, because R is for statistics, so it knows a lot about different um, random distributions, so it knows what a Gaussian distribution is and it knows what a, uh, what a uniform distribution is. So we will be talking about that and I will show you how you can generate random numbers from different distributions. Um, and of course clean and reusable code. Um, I always try to kind of hammer that in as much as possible because like, it, it really helps. Making clean code means that in the end code can be reju uh, reused by other people or by yourself. Good, so variables. Um, in my mind, and I showed you this slide before, I think variables are boxes. So you can put things in, and then after you put something in a variable or in a box, you can use the box without knowing what is in it. And that is the big abstraction of a variable, right? Because you can have a number, or you can have a character, or you can have a, a vector or a matrix, and you put it in a variable. And after that, you can use this variable and you can more or less forget what's in there because like, R can tell you what, what's in there. Um, so uh, the nice thing about these boxes is, is that you can do things with these boxes, um, but you don't have to know exactly what's in there. So what do we generally do with these boxes? Uh, so we, we can ask things from them, right? So uh, we, they are the workhorse of programming, so we do things with variables. So we can ask, for example, the length, how many, how many things are in the box. Um, does the box have a number of rows or have a number of columns, right, if we are talking about a matrix. Um, the SDR function um, is really useful when you are dealing with more complex objects um, because the SDR function just prints out a, a structure of the object. So how does it look? And this is useful when you have um, for example, a list, which at the first index has another list, which has a matrix in there, um, and then you go back to the first list, which then in the second element has a vector. So hey, when objects become really complex and when you're storing a lot of data into a single variable, um, then the SDR function can help you to kind of graphically see how, these op uh, how this object is structured. Of course, we can ask the class, and we have these two functions to force a, a box to be a certain type and we can ask if the box is of a certain type so as numeric or is numeric so the next thing what do we want to do with these boxes well these these boxes need to go somewhere so and for moving boxes in programming we have something called control structures so control structures in my mind are something like conveyor belts so when you take a box hey you it guides it to the correct destination on where it needs to go hey, so everything in programming is based on a fixed algorithm hey, because we want to go and hey, we want to load in a matrix then we want to do some manipulation with the matrix and then we want to write out a new matrix or a vector or a, a summary statistic after we've gone through the whole thing um, and of course this algorithm that we are designing um, contains two very important control structures one of the control structures is for branching, like taking a conveyor belt and then sending some boxes left and some other boxes right. And we have looping. So looping is something that we can do a repeated number of times, right? We can think of a matrix and for example, for each row of the matrix, I want to calculate the mean, right? So then I have to do something. So for each row in the matrix, calculate the mean. Right, so, and these are the only two, well, actually, well, there's some more control structures, but these are the most fundamental control structures in any computer language. Um, so, of course, also in R they exist. So, branching and looping. So, let's take a little bit of a, of a closer look at branching. So, branching is um, done by the if statement, and you can also branch using the switch statement. So, when I, th when I, th when you, when you do something with the if statement, for example, imagine that I have a variable called box um, and 
I can put something in this box which I don't know, right? So I can put a logical value in there, or I can put 12 in there, or I can put C in there. Um, and so a character vector. And I, then I can do an if statement, right? So I can ask if the class of this box, so the class of the variable is a character, then call the function write on this box. If, if the box is not a character, then we want to call the function left on this box. So this is just a way of, 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 of looking what is in the box and then based on the contents of the box, call function one, right, or call function two, left. And this is of course useful because yes, sometimes you have um, values in your box and then you can calculate a mean, um, but sometimes you, you have characters in, in, in the column of your matrix, so you cannot calculate a mean. And so if you if you have the if statement, and then you could skip the columns of the matrix which are character values so that you don't run into errors. Because if I want to calculate the mean of a character vector, then it will just say error and it will quit. So and when I then would write a, a little script which then looks first what the class is of the column that I'm looking at. If it is numeric, calculate the mean. If it is character, do nothing and just move on to the next one. The switch statement works very, very similar to the if statement. Um, it just allows you to switch multiple things. So the if statement checks one thing and then calls a function or does something. And then you have the else statement, which then is for everything which does not match the if statement. Uh, the switch statement is, is a little bit more flexible in a way, or it's, well, not so much more flexible, but it, it allows you to, to define three or four or five options, right? So here we say the same thing. So we switch on the class of the box. If the class of the box is logical, then we call the function left. If, the, if it is numeric, then we call the function middle. And if it's a character, then we call the function right. So we will use this during the, uh, the assignments to, to look if a value of a random number, for example, is below a certain value or if it's above a certain value, um, and then print out something. Of course, we can also make multiple roots or multiple comparisons using the if statement. Um, yeah, so this is the same if statement. Uh, this is the same as the switch statement, now just written using if statements. Yeah, so if the class of the box is a character, go right or call the function right on the box, else if the class of the box is logical, take call the function middle on the box and else call left. So he here we do two. Of course this is not exactly identical to the switch statement because the switch statement makes all of the character boxes go right, but it doesn't have anything for a matrix for example. While this one, the else statement is just a catch-all. Right? If it doesn't match this, if it doesn't match that, then we do this. So it's an if, else if, else. So the else catches everything. All right, so hey, you can of course use if statements for comparison. So I can say if some x, some variable x is smaller than five. And so if x is a single number, then this works perfectly fine. And then we can, for example, say print x is smaller than five. Um, we can also compare two variables to see if they of if variable x is smaller than y um, and this this works for single numbers if you have a vector right and you want to know if all of the values in the vector are smaller than five then you have to use the all function so you say x smaller than five so now it will compare every element of x or every element in the ve in vector x to the number five and if it is lower then it will return true. So in the end you get, if you have three, uh, three elements in your vector, it will say true, 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 if they're all lower than five. Or if the, the second one is higher than five, then it will say true, false, true. So the all statement you can use to kind of flatten these things into a single true or false. So if all of them are smaller than five, then it prints and otherwise it just skips this statement altogether. If you want to check if, if there is any number, so if, if one of the, of the three numbers in your vector is smaller than five, then you can use any. So all is to make sure that everything is, is true and any, that means that at least one of them is true. 
All right, so that's the if statement. It's just comparison. And based on the comparison, you can do A or you can do B. If you have the else if statement, then you could do three things or four things or five things. You can, you can add as many else if statements as you want. All right, so for while and repeat, so this is looping. So looping is like this. For example, I have a, a variable called box and I put a thousand in there. And then I do a for statement, so I say for x in 1 to 10, take the variable box, subtract the current value from x, and then put it back into the box. So when, I, when R hits this piece of code, the first time it will do 1000 minus 1, and then put 999 back in. Then it will recognize that it still needs to do 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 10. So then it executes the same statement again. Now with x having the value 2. So it takes 999 minus 2 is 997. Then it executes the statement again. 997 minus 3 is 994. Then it executes the statement again. So it just continues the statement. So you can do the statement once, you can do it twice, but in this case we are doing it 10 times. So the for loop is when you know how often you need to do something. For example, for each row of the matrix. So for x in 1, 2, so double point, number of rows, so n row of a matrix. Because now you know how many rows the matrix has. If you do not know how many rows there are, or if you want to repeat something, until a certain condition is reached, then you have to use a while statement. So a while statement is a slightly, slightly more complex than the for statement because you have to define this variable x yourself. Here in the for statement, we are defining x. But here in the while statement, I have to do that beforehand. So this is the exact same thing as the for statement. You can see that it's almost twice as long, but it does the same thing. But the advantage of using a while statement is, is that you can use it without knowing your bounds, so to speak. So you, if you don't know how many rows there are in the matrix, well, that's not really something that occurs. Yeah, but you could do something while something is true, right? Um, I have a sensor and this sensor measures temperature. And while the temperature is below 30 degrees Celsius, do something, for example, add the temperature to a plot. But I don't know how long the temperature will be below 30 degrees Celsius. It could be like one day, but it, it could be an, an hour. It could be like 30 seconds. And so the while statement allows you to loop an undefined or an undetermined number of times, which also allows you to loop forever, which is really annoying in R because it won't tell you that it's looping forever and you can wait like minutes until you get the output. But this does the same thing. So we define our box again. Then we define a variable called takeout, which sneakily is of course similar to the x variable that we have here. And now I say while takeout is smaller or equal to 10, do something. So I, I do the same statement, so box minus takeout is box. So, so. And now I have to remember that I have to increase the value by 1. So I say takeout is takeout plus 1. And of course this, this statement here is the same as what happens here. So x in 1 to 10, um, takeout is takeout plus 1. And then I compare if the takeout value is smaller or equal to 10. If not, then I then it executes the statement again. Um, or if, if this is true, it executes the statement again. If this is not true, then it just continues with the rest of the statement. The repeat statement is also there. I never use the repeat statement, so just forget about it. It's there. You can, and there's also a do while and stuff. But everything you can, or ever, everything that you ever wanted to do in programming, you can do with a for loop or you can do with a while loop. So the for loop allows you to iterate between known bounds. If you have unknown bounds because you you don't know how long something will or how often you have to do something, then you can use a while statement. And then usually I say at this slide, that's it. There's nothing more to programming. If you know what a variable is, if you know what a control structure is, and you can, you can write an if statement, and you can write a for statement, then you can program anything. Because your CPU in the computer 
does not know anything more than this. It knows what a variable is, it can do branching based on ifs, and it knows how to do a looping statement like a for or a while. And, and there's nothing more. Everything that we will see from this point on can be expressed by these three very basic concepts. Variables, branching, and looping. There's nothing else. Good. So then we're done with the first part of the lecture. Um, can we quickly run them? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, you wanna you you wanna know the answer? What's in the box? What's in the box? <laughs> All right, let's go to uh, to Notepad. I will quickly type them in. So, and this is why I use this is why I never directly type into R, right? Um, because if I would type directly into R and I would type four x in one to ten, right? Then now I have to do something, like, and then I have to press enter, and now you see it changes to a plus, and now I can close it. Ooh, there's so no. Write your for and I, uh, fr write your if statements and and while statements in a text editor and then copy them to R. It's just so much easier. Um, all right, so we want to know what's in the box. So let's make a new one. What's in the box? And we just save this as example one dot. All right, so um, we put some value in the box, a thousand. Then we say four x in one to ten. Oh, that's a little bit too quick. And then we say box equals box minus uh, minus x. And then we just copy paste. Uh, we go to R and we paste it in. So it does this ten times. And now we say box. And then there's 945 in the box. Surprising, right? Because people never think that there's so few things left in the box. But you take out one thing, then two things, then three things, then four things, then five, then six, then seven, then eight, and then nine. Uh, the while statement works exactly the same. So the while statement is the same. So we have a box again being a thousand. Then we say while, and we have to define our own iterator. So generally you would use i or x. So let's use x, right? So x is 1, so while x is smaller than or equal to 10. What do we want to do? We want to say box is box minus, minus x, and then x is x plus 1. If I don't do this, if I don't submit this line, it will run forever forever and ever and ever and will never stop so you you have to increase x right otherwise x will just be one so it will take one out of the box then it will take one out of the box but since x will never be larger than 10 it will never stop um, so let's just copy paste this in so let me move you guys to the r window again same thing and of course the box also contains 945 that's it. And of course the if statement, I can show you an if statement. So um, run if will give you a random number. Um, give me one random number, right? So every time that I run this, it will give me a different random number. These random numbers will be between um, zero and one. Um, so if I go then to my notepad plus plus window, um, I can say, well, if run if one, smaller than 0 0.5 cut and just print the word smaller add a new line so here I'm using the slash n to press the enter key or programmatically press the enter key so when I take this piece of code right then um, when I run it in R around half of the time this should say smaller um, and sometimes it won't say anything, right? Because it's not it, the number that it drew is not smaller than than 0 0.5. Um, and of course, like kind of half of the time, it will say smaller. Good. All right, then um, I'm going to do a short break. I have prepared some nice gifts for you guys. Now I don't know if I took cats first or squirrels. 
So it's going to be either cats or squirrels, but uh, I'll, I'll have to see. And when I get back, remind me to um, start the recording, because otherwise I have to do a whole bunch of video editing to get the recording out of, out of Twitch. Um, all right, so let me switch you guys back to the PowerPoint, and then I will see you in around 10 minutes, so 310.